My call story was what I call an emergent call story. It happened as, um, as I was trying to live into my uh, new life in Christ. And um, when I had the experience of Christ and the experience of Christ just confirmed uh, my knowledge of Christ that I had had uh, built up over the years of being in church and listening to all of the stories of the gospel and of the Old Testament, um, it all came together where the person uh, and work of Jesus Christ became real. And then my next, my next question was, what does all this mean as I live my life in, in the world? Uh, first of all, as, as a husband, uh, as a father, and then as a co-worker um, at that time for the school district. And um, so I've, I try to look for ways to express my faith as a teacher as I had conversations with uh, other teachers that I would work with at the high school, and then also as a coach. So I had several faith conversations with the coaches, and um, I just found myself increasingly um, passionate about doing that. Uh, I also found a way to serve um, at the local church, so I, could, I did almost anything that was asked from me, uh, from teaching youth to uh, serving on different committees, um, and I also got to do a little bit of lay preaching, and also some uh, work in the community was starting uh, cell group Bible studies, and I would just invite people that I would meet at school or um, uh, through my coaching uh, experience to come to the Bible study at the house, and we grew from five to 25, 30, 35, some, some nights we'd have 35 people at the house. Most of the people didn't attend church. and. And so I just found myself more and more um, desirous of, of doing this. Um, when my wife and I moved into, into business and the business grew and I left teaching and coaching, then I found a way to express my faith through, through my uh, business as well. So I found myself having all kinds of faith conversations with our clients. So this went on for several years <clears throat> until one day I just started feeling a, a detachment um, uh, towards towards those to, towards my business and and I started asking myself you know am, am I really spending my life doing um, something that is that is worthwhile and I'm not saying there's there was nothing wrong with the business I was in but I just felt that there was something more there a yearning in me started to occur um, at that point I had a, a very powerful call call experience um, well, one night I, I just um, I, I was thinking about going to law school and uh, I was driving to a friend of mine who was a former jeweler. My wife and I had a jewelry store and we were going to do some jewelry repair work that night and then turn it back in the next morning. And so when I drove by, uh, a tent revival actually was happening outside of, of um, uh, on the side of the road, uh, the word of the Lord came to me and said, you know, he said, I want you to be an attorney, but be an attorney for me and argue my case before the people. And so. I stopped the car and I started to pray. I said, Lord, if this is, if this is what, uh, what you're calling me to do, then I need for you to do two things. Number one, confirm it. And number two, um, help me move past all of my business obligations and, and liabilities. And so uh, to make a long story short, within 90 days, uh, my wife and I, we sold our business. Uh, we paid off all of our debts um, and uh, we found ourselves at seminary. Um, and I was sitting in in Billy Abraham's class, uh, The Philosophy of Theology, uh, in August. And so it ha I got the call in April, and we sold our business uh, during the months of May, and in June and July, uh, we transitioned, and in August, I was at uh, Perkins School of Theology um, in that class, wondering to myself, how in the world did I get from there to here? But I find that the call to ministry is not a, a one-time threshold that we cross over it is a continual call to ministry as, as in each stage of my uh, ongoing ministry in, in the ordained, uh, as an ordained pastor, I have to ask myself very often, Lord, who are you calling me to be and what are you calling me to do? And I found that that has uh, shifted and changed over the years in many ways that I had never even, uh, would not have even imagined. The discernment process and the call to ministry, again, is not a once and for all moment or event. It is a, um, a continuous um, experience and process that, um, that we live into uh, by faith. 
Uh, we, we walk uh, by faith and not by sight. And just when I think I have been stretched to, to, to what I am comfortable with being stretched um, uh, is, um, the Lord stretches me out further and calls me more and more out of myself. So I think, I think that the call to ministry is a call to come out of myself for the sake of Christ on behalf of the others. As a former business person, and I, I don't think we lose who we are when we come into ministry. We just transfer all of that uh, into, into what we do. Uh, and as a former business person and, and as a coach and as a teacher, I mean, one of the things that I always you know, focused on was how can I put um, uh, the people uh, or myself in the best position to succeed? And so, um, and for me, success in ministry has a lot to do with, with growth and vitality. And um, uh, the challenge is, you know, not, not to buy into the narrative of scarcity and decline, but the challenge is to say, well, if this is, if this is our given, then what uh, resources and what abundance do we have uh, within our reach that we can then leverage and maximize for God's kingdom purposes? So. My hope for, for any ministry that I have ever received, whether it's, it's a two-point charge in El Paso when I had a congregation of 20 uh, and then another one of 25 that eventually grew to be 145 in four years with 68 baptisms. Uh, and also, you know, investment in properties and expansion of facilities and um, a tripling of the budget, you know, uh, for, for, for churches that were historically, you know, in decline, um, is, is, that, is that we would enhance and expand the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Wesleyan tradition throughout the boundaries of the Great Plains Annual Conference in the most effective and efficient way possible. My goal would be, my hope would be, uh, that our pastors would, would be able to understand the mission field where they are, uh, and then uh, develop uh, a way of being in ministry that would be, um, that would be embracing and also uh, reaching uh, uh, in Christ's love to the people uh, in that community, in that region, so that they can want to be a part of, um, of the church, so that they could have access to the fullness of the means of God's grace through worship, through Christian community, through prayer, um, through, um, through fellowship, and through um, the, the uh, gifts of service and generosity so that they can really live into the fullness of the life in Christ and be shaped and fashioned into a disciple for Jesus Christ in the world who in turn are making you disciples for Jesus Christ. And so what I'm talking about here is not a static institution but a movement, a movement of people who are excited about Jesus Christ, excited about having a faith conversation, and also committed to, to the reality that Christ changes lives, and when lives are changed, our world is changed. For me, what, one of the first characteristics of a clergy is that you are caring for your own inner life, your own devotional um, um, relationship with, with Jesus Christ, above and beyond, beyond all, all else. So, how you do that, I mean, there's many ways to do that, um, but to, to stay centered. The, the next thing is that um, how, do we, how do we live out the four core Wesleyan tenets, right, of proclaiming Christ, of helping people to love God, of leading people to serve others, especially uh, the poor or the economically isolated, and then how do we do justice? So, so the, these are the four basic tenets of our Wesleyan witness. So the first two have got to do with the inner and, and nurturing life, right? How do we proclaim Christ? As, as a pastor, you are the chief evangelist. I mean, you, and, the, and by being the chief evangelist means that either you do it yourself or you equip others to do that. But, but, the, but the idea is that you get the gospel of Jesus Christ out into the community, whether it's having faith conversations around small groups or, or, uh, or whether you, ha you have them with, with uh, people that are seeking. Uh, but ultimately, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. How will they believe if nobody uh, uh, preaches or teaches? 
And so, and so part of our office is that, is that teaching ministry and that preaching ministry, that proclamation ministry. You know, we are very good about service, but sometimes we do service without really telling people why we are in service. And so uh, proclaiming Christ and first of all, Christ as a healer, um, Christ as a, as a liberator, um, Christ as, as, a, as one that, f that fills us and fulfills us, and, and also Christ as the one that, um, uh, that saves us and forgives us and restores us. You know, who, who is Jesus Christ to you and, and how does Jesus Christ manifest it? And, and, and what, why is Jesus Christ so desirable that people would say yes to Christ and then uh, submit their lives to him and follow him? So that's the first one. The next one is, you know, how do, how do you help people love God? And as, as a pastor, you're to set up the ecology of a church so that people can have access to the means of God's grace through um, vital worship, through prayer, through Bible study, through Christian fellowship, um, through the sacraments, so that people's life can be um, um, infused with the life of God in them. Uh, and, and whatever you can do to make that happen, you know, that's part of our role because the deeper people's lives uh, grow in God, then then the, then the higher and the broader the, the reach is uh, beyond themselves into the community. So if you want to, to really grow your ministry, you have to help your people go deep in their faith. Uh, the deeper they go, the broader the ministry outreach is because, because the more they're able to surrender and to give their lives to God in, in generosity and in service to the world. The third thing is, you know, how do we serve? Uh, serving others is not about me having things to give to the other but engagement with the other transforms who I am. I come to understand who they are. I come to understand their, uh, their plight, and it, it, um, um, it, it creates a compassion and a, and a mercy in me uh, that I can then respond to uh, with, with, uh, in the ways that, that I am capable of. And so, so and, and here again, the, the more we've experienced the grace and the mercy and the compassion of Christ upon us as sinners, the more we can then uh, extend that to others. When you serve others, you realize that, you know, they, they find themselves where they are, some, sometimes in part because of the decision that they've made, but then you realize that the context in which they live and the challenges that they face as human beings uh, really um, um, uh, closes off some of the opportunities that other people, you know, have by privilege. And so now you get into the justice issues and you start looking to see, you know, how do you alleviate suffering by, by, um, by doing justice. And, and what this looks like is different in, in m many contexts. That, brings us to take action either through advocacy, um, uh, which means that you know, we may write to um, legislators or we may organize you know, the community uh, for their, to enable their own agency in action, whatever it is. But I don't think that our United Methodist Witness is just about me and Jesus. It's about me in relationship with Jesus and, and how I live it out in the world in a way that, um, that brings about the goodness and the justice of God uh, to all people, especially the most vulnerable, which are our children and our elderly um, and other populations that are in our communities. First of all, all baptized Christians are called to ministry. Um, Secondly, as a minister of Jesus Christ, then all of us are uh, discerned. Normally, we think of discernment as being only for people that are thinking about the ordained ministry. Um, but that's not true. I can recall times in my life as a layperson when I was discerning what God was calling me to do and who God was calling me to be at, at that time. Now, this can be an individual call, but it can also be a collective call. Who is God calling us to be? And what is, what is God calling us to do? So, so discernment, first of all, is a, a, um, 
a, a discipline or a process that all Christians um, can can use and should use as as their own understanding of how they live out their faith in Christ continues to emerge o over the years. So 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 that said, um, the question is, you know, do people around you affirm your call? So you you have a sense that God is calling you to do something. Um, do people close to you see those gifts and graces in you? One of the things that my parents told me when I told them that I was thinking about going to ministry, they said, well, what took you so long? We already knew that. Um, I, it just took me a while to come to that realization. As my wife did, she says, well, yeah, I, I can see how that would happen. So do your immediate family and friends see the work of God in you? Secondly, does your church affirm your calling? Um, as, you, as you live out your faith in your church, you know, do the people in your church say, yeah, this person has the gifts and graces for ministry? Um, and do they support you in that work? Uh, and then thirdly, you know, as you move out into, into, the, um, into the world and, and explore your calling, you know, do, do you love the people of God? And, and I think that's one of the things that, that happens as, as you're called into ministry. Uh, you're called to love others who are not like you. Paul said, the love of Christ compels me, uh, right? It, the, so Paul, Paul was in relationship with people from all walks of life and many different nationalities and cultures and, and understandings and, and theological perspectives, but yet he found a way to be all things to all people that he may win them to Christ. And so one of the things that happens when we're called to ministry is that we have to uh, confront our own prejudices and our own biases uh, and our own apprehensions about the other and, and see ourselves as, as emissaries, as an ambassadors uh, for Jesus Christ. And I, I'll be very frank with you. I mean, sometimes I'm sitting at an airport and I'm watching people walk by uh, from all walks of life, and I realized the poverty of my love. I asked myself, you know, can I, can I love all of these people? Uh, I know that I love my immediate family, and I love my close friends, and I, and I, and I love the people I work with, uh, but, but when you're in mission and ministry, you're called to, to love people that you never would have imagined you would, you would be called to love. And, and you can only do that because because you've been touched and reached by the love of God in you. Are you willing to surrender? <laughs> are, you, are you willing to put aside your stuff and just, and just be open to what God has for you? And that's probably the most challenging and, and the most um, uh, scary thing about this whole uh, enterprise is that, you know, once you say, I will follow, right? then you, you, kind of, you kind of give up your rights in, in many ways and, and you allow yourself to be used uh, by Christ. You know, John Wesley's covenant prayer, you know, put me to use or put me aside. Uh, let, let me be, um, you know, and, and Wesley talks about, you know, let, let me be raised up for you or let me be, let, cast aside for you. And, and Wesley understands that's just the nature of ministry. Um, we, we, you know, we, we got to take care of ourselves, and I'm not talking about the self-sacrificing that is, that is just totally self-destructive, but, but how, what is our capacity to put the well-being of others ahead of ourselves and to seek, to seek out their, uh, their wellness and to seek out, you know, uh, things that are in their best interest. And so, as a pastor, you will be responsible for a congregation. It might be 20 people, it might be 50, it might be 100, it might be 500, it might be 20,000. The question is, you know, can you be a shepherd that's going to seek out what's in their best interest and, and lead them to a place where they can, first of all, grow in the love of God, help tell others about Christ, uh, serve others, especially the vulnerable, and then uh, live justly in the world? Yeah, I, I find that ministry and, and discipleship uh, and the ordained ministry is a call to follow. It's also a call to surrender. It's a call to grow. 
It's a call to, um, to love. It's a call to, um, to hold fast when the future is uncertain. And it's a call to trust in Jesus uh, who called you into ministry. So God bless you. Thanks for listening. Uh, you're in our prayers as uh, you go through this discernment process. You're in the right place. I'm just really blessed to know that the Holy Spirit is still uh, calling people uh, to Jesus and to ministry. Uh, you are where you need to be. Uh, listen to God. Take care of your prayer life. Uh, listen to the people close to you. Listen to the affirmation of the church. Listen to your mentors. Talk to your district superintendents. Talk to another pastor that has walked down the road, uh, and they will be able to share their experiences with you. So uh, whatever you decide, um, uh, I, I always look for that sense of peace. The ordained ministry or licensed local pastor or deacon or, or some other pathway may not be right for you, and that's okay. Uh, you are still called to ministry as a baptized Christian. So go and be the best minister that God has called you to be. Peace and grace.